This is Sunday Night True Stories. Hello, I'm Melissa Doyle. Ivan Milat, just saying the name, is enough to send an ice chill down your spine. Milat was convicted of the murders of seven backpackers in the late 80s and early 90s. Tonight, Steve Pennells revisits the terrifying crimes, unearthing new information and identifying more potential victims. You will also hear from a British backpacker who believes he came within seconds of becoming one of Malat's earliest kills. So Colin, he's driving along yeah. and then suddenly, just out of the blue, he suddenly said, oh, I'm gonna turn off here. This road here? Yes. So I said, well, I'm going to Colbar, so you can just drop me off here. He just continued driving down this road here. At this, point, at this point in time, what are you thinking? Well, I'm just, I'm just thinking, when's he going to stop to let me out? And he, uh, he just kept on driving. This is, a, this is a map I had at the time. So what does it show us? So it was here in Blackheath, where he picked me up hitchhiking about 9, 9.30 in the morning, on the Tuesday morning. And you haven't been back at the spot in all these years? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Th it'll be about 37 years. 37 years. All right. The man who picked you up that day, was this him? That was him. That was definitely the creep who picked me up, but he wasn't smiling. <laughs> he wasn't smiling. He never smiled the whole time. That I saw, uh, that I saw him. He never smiled. He was in predatory mode when I saw him. Ivan Robert Marco Malat, as he was in his killing prime, the most feared predator in Australian criminal history, and as he is now, terminally ill, his body ravaged by throat and stomach cancer, at death's door. Ivan is a very evil person. I think dying is the best thing he could do for the community. Malat's death won't come soon enough for many, but the horror he unleashed here in the Belangolo State Forest on seven young backpackers is a stain that will never be erased from the Australian psyche. Tonight, the evil crimes of Ivan Malat. Seven brutal murders, but were there more? For the first time, the backpacker who says Malat tried to abduct him returns to the place where he says he came close to being one of Malat's first victims. The hammer was there to beat me with it, to murder me with it. That's why the hammer was there. Inside the divided Malat family, torn by their strange love... I want the public to understand that he's not the monster they say. ..and hate for the serial killer. Psychopath. Total psychopath. That's it. And we'll reveal the unsolved murders, killings that police and a member of Malat's own family believe he's behind. My own view is that you could say there's one definite murder and there are two others quite possible. Former police superintendent Clive Small has been intimately involved in some of the biggest investigations in the country but none more chilling and confronting than Ivan Malat's backpacker murders. There are the names of the seven backpackers? Yes. What, what do you feel when, you, when you're here at this spot? Well, I think it's a terrible part of our history. Um, we have to remember it, and that, um, being blunt, um, Ivan Malat was a terrible person. Still is. Tell me about the Malat family. The Malat family is a quite unusual family. Uh, Ivan's father uh, was a Croatian, wasn't here that long before he met his wife. They married a couple of years later. She started almost from the day they were married, uh, having children. Uh, I think it was uh, 14 children they had. Ivan Malat's my brother, my younger brother. What's it like carrying the Malat name? Bad, 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 bad. Boris Malat hasn't spoken publicly since this interview I did with him a few years ago because of the anger it sparked within the Malat family. 
They didn't want you to do this interview, did they? Definitely did not want me to do this interview. Much of our conversation has never been broadcast until now. What was life like back then for Ivan and for you? you I mean... It was just out of control. He was out of control. Smart ass, running around, out of control. Uh, going out, getting into trouble with, you know, different guys and, and girls and things. You talked before about Ivan having a, a cruel streak about him. At what age did you first see that? Oh, I'd seen that probably... It was pretty normal up until about 12, 14. And I started to see that. I heard about that from the, his mates, you know, They'd all boast about they'd go out at night and do things. And, you know, with machetes, I hear tell he cut a dog in half with a machete and all that while he was growing up. Were you concerned about him back then? Oh, I knew where he, I knew he was on him on my trip. <laughs> I knew that. It was just a matter of how long. He was going to kill somebody from the, from the age of 10, I'd say. You know, it was built into him. He, he had a different psychic. He was a psychopath. And it, it just manifested itself in manifested itself with, uh, you know, I can do anything. The Malats grew up with knives and guns as part of everyday life. They had spent afternoons shooting at targets in their parents' market garden. We've all owned guns since we were seven, six and seven. We used to have to sit mat boxes on the end of the tomato beds, which was about 20 metres away, and... Um, and knock them over. In their early teens, Ivan and his brothers were small-time crooks, breaking into homes and stealing. When Ivan was 17, he secretly confessed to Boris that he had shot a taxi driver during a failed attempted robbery. His rifle had misfired and hit the cabbie, Neville Knight, in the spine, leaving the young father paralyzed from the waist down. The bloke straight away knew he, he had lost everything in his bottom end, you know, his legs, feelings. He knew what went through his back. He knew he was... A... Ivan had paralysed him. Ivan paralysed him, yeah. Milat fled, and soon after, an innocent man was wrongly convicted and served five years for the shooting. He said, they're blaming someone else. He said, which is good. But I didn't think it was good. <laughs> but I didn't want to see him go to jail either. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to see him harmed either. Even now, because at that stage, he really hadn't proved his, his worth, you know what I mean? And he was your little brother. He was my little brother. He hadn't gone on to bigger things. Milat's bigger crimes would begin soon enough. In 1992 and 1993, the bodies of five women and two men, all backpackers, were found here in the Belangelo State Forest. The crime scenes themselves were little clearings in a very dense forest, as you can see from around he, here. He didn't try to hide the bodies? No, he didn't try. They were in uh, small areas that were clear. Uh, the bodies were left there on the basis, I believe, of he believed no one else would see them anyway. He chose his victims a certain type of victim. They were between 19 and 22. They were backpackers, they're people who could disappear quite easily. He was picking up backpackers because they'd have no friends there. There'd be very few people that would have seen them. Being backpackers, they were sort of isolated from other members of their family and that, in effect, would give Ivan um, more protection and less likelihood of detection. British tourists Caroline Clark and Joanne Walters were the first to be discovered. Joanne had been stabbed 21 times in the back and 14 in the chest. Caroline had been shot 10 times in the head. Young Victorian couple Deborah Everest and James Gibson were next. James had been stabbed eight times. Deborah had been savagely beaten. The last to be found were German couple Anja Habschied and Gabor Neugebauer, not far from the remains of another German backpacker, Simone Schmidl. Anya had been decapitated, and despite an extensive police search, her head has never been found. Some were shot and uh, stabbed multiple times. Um, one, in fact, was shot in the, around the head, where the offender had walked around the, the person, shooting them in the head from different angles. Well, now, that shows you how 
malicious and nasty the murders were. Another one was stabbed in the back multiple times. So there were some that had a mixture of shootings and knifings. There were some similarities, but there were also dissimilarities. You can understand why Malat chose this place. It's just off the highway, it's isolated, and if you called out for help, no one would hear you. What was the most shocking thing about, about these murders? It was uh, the apparent time that was spent committing the murders and spent at the crime scene by the offender. He was trying to drag out their deaths. The, the dress, deaths were being dragged out, and the fact that there were a number of deaths also shows that he was becoming more and more committed to the murders. It was sadistic, the, so sadistic. And, and to the way in which they were killed, it was being prolonged. To what end? Why would well, he want to do that? I think it was just the uh, comfort he was getting himself out of carrying out the murders. Sadistic the satisfaction. More, sadistic satisfaction. The more, the more it took, the more that was involved, the more time he spent there, um, became a greater pleasure. There was evidence in the Belangelo State Forest that would help police better understand the deranged killer they were chasing. Soon enough, they'd have a prime suspect. Next. How would you describe Ivan? Psychopath. Total psychopath. The police close in on Ivan Malat. Ivan's home was like a gold mine. Dividing his family. Is he a murderer? No, not a chance and exposing their darkest secrets. Ivan's given you permission to talk to us. Yes. Why you? I'm in the Belangelo State Forest, southwest of Sydney, with the man who arrested Ivan Malat for the terrible crimes he committed here. The bodies of seven backpackers, five women and two men, were found in the forest in 1992 and 1993. If you want to kill someone, this, this is kind of the place to do it, isn't it? It's, it's quite isolated. You can understand why Malat chose this place. It, it, it's, uh, it's a very large forest. It's very thick and dense. And the likelihood of finding a body that's dropped or deposited in a denser part of the forest away from the tracks is unlikely. The key breakthrough that would link Ivan Milat to the bodies in Belangelo came from British backpacker Paul Onions. He was hitchhiking in January 1990 and was picked up by Milat. Onions became suspicious of Milat's attitude and they made an excuse to stop the car. This was not far from Belangelo. Paul Onions ran off and was pursued by Malat, who fired a number of shots at him. A car coming up the highway pulled over and gave Paul Onions to get in, because the driver had seen him running up the road, waving his hands and yelling. Based on Onions alone, there was enough there to arrest Malat for the attempted murder of Onions, even if, at worst, we couldn't link it to the other backpackers. So it was worth test it was worth going in. On May 22nd, 1994, simultaneous raids were launched on seven Malat family properties. Ivan's home was like a gold mine. There was money and camping equipment belonging to the murdered backpackers, along with photos of Ivan and his girlfriend. And there was a photograph of her on the wall in one of the rooms, wearing a top. The top belonged to one of the murdered backpackers. There was some rope and some plastic um, ties that had been similar to those used in the abduction and uh, murder of the backpackers. But it always seemed that Ivan had no intention of hiding the equipment. It was there for anyone to see who went into his house. What made it even more interesting was that property belonging to the backpackers was also found in most of the homes of the Malat family. 
building. How did it get there? They said, Ivan gave this to us. This was a case of Ivan giving his family property belonging to murder victims, and then Ivan knowing and watching them use that property. Again, it's, I'm in control. During the raids, police also found one of the weapons Ivan used to kill the backpackers, a rifle hidden inside a wall. Milat was arrested and taken in for questioning. When was the first time you laid eyes on Ivan Milat? Um, the first time I actually saw him was on the day of his arrest in 1994. I had seen pictures of him and that before that, uh, because he had been under surveillance for some time. At that moment, face to face, man to man, did he look to you like someone capable of carrying out those murders? He looked as though he was, a per uh, was an unusual personality. He believed that he was in control at all stages. Even during his arrest? Even during his arrest. After a 15-week trial, Milat was found guilty and jailed for seven consecutive life sentences, one for each of the backpackers he killed. But then, and now, Milat maintains he never killed anyone. Do you believe Ivan did it, all those murders alone? My belief is yes. If he did act alone, do you think there were people who may have known what he'd done? Yes. Ivan's mother used to visit him regularly. Not long before she died, she was asked by one of her sons about Ivan, and she told him that Ivan had confessed to the murders to her. And you believe that? Yes. Why would Ivan have told her? She had been visiting him at the jail and basically had been, had asked him a number of times about this, but had basically put to him, tell me the truth before I die. How did it affect her, do you know? Well, the part that uh, is interesting is that even after she had been told this and told a member of the family this, she still proclaimed his innocence. It says a lot about the Malats, doesn't it? It does. Not all of the Malats, but a number of them, yes. The Malats are a family deeply divided over Ivan's guilt. On one side, his older brother, Boris. How would you describe Ivan? Psychopath. Total psychopath. That's it. Yeah, total psychopath. On the other side, Milat's nephew, Alastair Shipsey. He's always been a tower of strength to the family, an inspiration to all of us. He's always been happy. He's good-hearted. He's been the first one to help everybody and look after things. Is he a murderer? No, not a chance. Alistair's complete denial of his uncle's crimes is the view held by many in the Malat family. He even claims to have Ivan's blessing to talk to us. Ivan's given you permission to talk to us? Yes. Yeah. Why you? Well, I, I want to get it out there so the public can see he's been vilified. He's not the monster that they say, because all the media's done in the past is portrayed him as a villain. Who is he? Ivan's a good soul who's been framed. Alistair has been one of Ivan's most prolific pen pals. He has piles of letters. Most are Ivan protesting his conviction. He says, the highest judge in New South Wales Supreme Court judiciary attempting to cover up a miscarriage of justice. In a recent letter to his nephew, Ivan Milat signs his name. My regards to all, love Ivan. Innocent. Ivan, innocent. You've been writing letters for a number of years. Yeah, he was my favourite uncle. He was, I always looked up to him. And I've been writing to him all the way. Hello, Alistair. I continue with further details and observation on my case. A statement of innocence and injustice. On the 27th In the July, letters, Ivan claims he is a victim of a huge conspiracy. What an incompetent moron the judge was. The Ivan family blames Clive Small for setting Ivan up. The appeal and review courts cover it up, protect their system by Ivan, innocent, framed by Clive Small. So you think Ivan was stitched up? 100%. There's no doubt about it. They've done a good job vilifying the, him to the public, but they left 90% of the evidence out. They only told the public what they wanted them to know. Who's they? The, the, well, the system, we could say. 
So who was involved in this? If Ivan was framed, who did it? It must be the government because when the Olympic board rang up and said, how do we know it's a safe place in Australia with these murders in the forest? Well, all they thought about was billions of dollars and millions of tourists. They couldn't afford to miss out on that. How much support does Ivan have? There are, I've got thousands of people wanting to have a retrial. There's only one person that has a problem with him in the family, or two. You know, Boris is the main one, but we all know why. Because Ivan had an affair with his wife and he's been upset about it. Boris Malat was very upset over Ivan's affair with his wife, Marilyn. The 11 year illicit relationship led to the birth of a daughter, Lenice. Boris says he came close to shooting his brother over the affair. I had him in my sights. The gun was fully loaded, you know, and got it up there and really let go. I was ready to let go. I was ready to. But every time I went to fire on the mongrel, uh, Mum would walk in front of it. And I thought, this is too dangerous. I'm going to hit one of these people I don't want to hit. I only want to take him out. And that guy was looking at me straight on through that window. He was staring straight at me. And he just kept looking like that. And I got this gun on him. And I, I thought about it and I, I put it down, put it back in the door of my truck. Lenise may be Malat's only child. She's now in her 50s and lives north of Sydney. Hello. Is that Lenise? No, I'm here, mate. What do you want? Oh, Lenise sorry, declined our request yeah. for an interview. I'm just wondering if, if we could talk to you about your dad. Um, not really. I've had my say. I don't know. They're they, they going to listen about that or not. I don't know. But anyway, mate, I can't help you yeah. with that. Is there anything you want people to know? No. As far as I'm concerned, he's dead and buried long ago. He's finished. This isn't about Ivan. This is about the truth. It's not about Ivan. The, the trouble is here, I have relatives that I might sound like I'm vexatious against them, but it's not really. It's just that I find they're a gutless lot because they, they just will not speak the truth. Next, the one that got away. But well, a man that picked me up was Ivan Malat. Face to face with a psychopath. I knew there was going to be trouble. He had his hand behind his back, holding the hammer. How Colin almost became one of Ivan Malat's earliest kills. The man who picked you up that morning, was this him? That was him. That was definitely the creep who picked me up, but he wasn't smiling. It's early morning at Sydney Airport. Colin. How are you doing? Welcome to Australia, mate. All righty. It's been a while since you've been back? Yes, uh, 30, 37 years, I think it would be. Colin Powers has made the long journey from Newcastle in the UK to relive what he says was a terrifying encounter that happened nearly 40 years ago. How are you feeling? Big uh, emotions. Like an old soldier come back for, to a battlefield that he almost lost his life. Colin was last here in 1982. Then he was a 21-year-old backpacker who planned to spend a year travelling and working around Australia. Why Australia? Well, you know, it's one of the good romantic destinations, you know, it's just adventure, really. Colin would go on to have an adventure he would never forget. But it didn't begin the way he'd planned. Can't believe you kept the map after all these years. Yeah, I, uh, I found it in a, in a, in a cupboard stored away. This is, a, this is a map I had at the time. He spent two nights in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney before hitchhiking inland. Which way did you go? This way here, through Lithgow to Bathurst. He wanted a ride to the town of Cobar near Dubbo, where he'd been told there was work in the mines. It took me about maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and finally somebody stopped, and it was a pickup truck. I got my backpack off and I went to throw it in the tray. And when I did that, a fella said, no, mate, don't do that. Put it here in the cab, it's a lot safer. And there was nothing else in the back of that truck except one large hammer that was right in the, in the, in the corner of the, of the truck. OK. <clears throat> OK. 
So the first time you see his face, can you describe him for me in, in detail? Well, he had a baseball cap on. He looked uh, mid, mid to late 30s. He had like a, a faint moustache, a few days growth beard, and he had work boots on. The man who picked you up that, that morning, was this him? That was him with a baseball cap on. That was definitely the creep who picked me up, but he wasn't smiling. He was shorter than I am, kind of muscular, but he never said hello. He just, he just said, put your seatbelt on, mate. So I put my seatbelt on, and then he said, uh, and he reached over and he pointed and he said, put that button down. And I looked at him, it's like, why would I put the button down? Why would you say that to anybody over 10 years old? And I looked at him in a quizzical way and he said, we don't want you to fall out, mate. So I wanted to ride. So he told you to lock, to lock the door? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I did it. And the first thing he said to me was, um, how long have you been in Australia? And he said, who knows you're here? And I said, well, I've only been here two days and I don't know anybody here. And with that, he went into a kind of trance right away. Just, he went into a trance, like deep into thought. He wasn't speaking. Colin says Malat remained silent until he took a sudden left turn for no apparent reason. Even though it was nearly 40 years ago, Colin says the ordeal was so vivid, he remembers the road they turned down. Suddenly, out of the blue, he just said, I'm turning off here. And I said, I'm going to go to Corbar, so just drop me off right here. But instead of dropping me off, he continued driving down here for about 500 yards before he finally stopped, claiming that it wasn't safe to stop and at the same time looking in the, looking in the mirror. About a half a kilometre down the dirt road, Malat stopped and Colin went to get out of the car. By the time I got the car door open, he was stood about where you are right now. He had his hand behind his back with that uh, holding the hammer. And I knew there was going to be trouble right then because he had no reason to get out of the vehicle. What saved me is some cars came past. And as the cars came past, Ivan Malat was looking over his shoulder at them and looking at me at the same time because he was just about to strike. And because he was acting suspiciously, they were looking at both of us. And it, uh, it gave me an opportunity to... Uh, Gave you the window to get out? Just to quickly get out and then get the, pull the seat forward like this. I put my head and shoulders in there to try to get the backpack out. And at the same time, he was stood right behind me like that. So he was, he was standing right here? But he couldn't do anything because the cars were still The cars were still coming past, and he wanted to, though. He was looking at the cars, looking at me. When I had the backpack, I swung it over my shoulder like this, and he was blocking my path. So I, I, I shouldered past him like this and started walking away. And when I got about 20 foot away, he called out to me, hey, mate. And I looked back, and he was lounging against the tailgate of his truck. And he said something like, have a safe trip, or look after yourself, mate. And that was the last time I saw Ivan Malat. It was many years later when Colin saw a documentary about the backpacker murders that he says he recognized Malat as the man who picked him up hitchhiking that morning. Since then, he's had plenty of time to ponder the what ifs. I think with Malat, I think he, he saw backpackers in his primitive kind of hillbilly world. Backpackers were a, a form of exotic wildlife that migrated through his territory, and he could just go out and kill them for fun. That's, that's the way I see Malat. He was just, he, he, he saw backpackers as like stray dogs that could be picked off the street taken into the bush and used for target practice, you know, killed for sport, so to speak. That was his, that was his primitive kind of worldview. Next. Malat was working in that area. Ivan Malat's other victims revealed. There were a number of similarities. All the signs of All Ivan the signature Malat. signs of Ivan Malat. But how many bodies are out there? Do you believe his victim count is at least double? I, I definitely think it is at least double.
Backpacker Colin Powers claims that in January 1982, he was picked up hitchhiking in the Blue Mountains by a man he's identified as Ivan Milat. He says Milat came at him with a hammer, but a passing car gave him the opportunity to escape. No, I thought it was robbery. I thought it was attempted robbery. That's what I was sure of. Did you go to the police? No, because there was nothing to report. He never laid a hand on me. He never robbed me. He didn't run away with my, with my backpack. Colin Powers never reported his terrifying ordeal to police, but he's adamant that the man he encountered that day was Ivan Milat. And his story does bear remarkable similarities to a murder that would take place in the same region five years later. The victim was also a hitchhiker, 18-year-old Peter Letcher, who disappeared while trying to get a ride from Sydney to Bathurst. His body was found in a state forest, not far from where Colin Powers says he'd also been hitchhiking. Peter Letcher had been shot five times. There were a number of similarities in that murder with the backpackers. Probably one of the most significant was the fact that he was both stabbed and shot. And the bullets that were some found there, some spent shells, uh, appeared to have been fired by the same type of weapon that was used in the backpacker murders, and the bullets themselves appeared to be the same type. All the signature signs of All Ivan the signature Milat. signs of Ivan Milat. And Milat was working in that area at the time. And it's not the only unsolved murder Ivan is likely to have committed during his long reign of terror. Clive Small suspects he's responsible for two other cold cases. There are a couple of victims I believe Ivan had in addition to the backpackers whose bodies were found in the forest here. The first is 20-year-old Karen Rowland, last seen in the Canberra area in February 1971. She was last seen hitchhiking. The position of her body in some bush just off the road was not dissimilar to the victims here. And uh, there was another woman who was seen hitch who was last known to hitchhike, and uh, her body was found some years later, and she'd been stabbed to death, and again was in the bush, and it was not dissimilar. That woman was 30-year-old Diane Penachio, who was last seen in 91 in the town Bungendore on the outskirts of Canberra. Just like the backpacker murders, both Karen and Diane's remains were found in state forests. They both appeared to have been sexually assaulted, and the discovery of beer bottles at their crime scenes was a sign the killer took his time. It was very statistic, and you got the impression that this was all about giving Ivan pleasure. And prolonging the deaths. And gave, prolonging the deaths. That gave him pleasure. Gave him pleasure. So you believe there's more than just this seven? I believe there's more than just seven, um, but not too many more. On that prediction, Boris Milat strongly disagrees. He's certain his brother's body count will go even higher. You said you believe his victim count is at least double what they, what they think it is. I, I definitely think it is. I think it is at least double, at least. Uh, uh, well, if it's not double, but in my mind, it'd have to be. I mean, say so he was doing it in one place. He was also living in other places, surely. There's suspects all over the place. Her suspects up there in Newcastle, Belmont. You know, he was working there. Ivan Milat has spent the past 25 years behind bars, most of it at Goulburn Supermax Prison. He's maintained his innocence the whole time, except for one moment when he appeared to let his guard down. When I saw him in 2005 at Goulburn Jail, and he accused me of suggesting his, uh, one of his sisters was involved in the murders, and I'd never suggested she was involved, because I know you did them by yourself. His response was, yes. So why are you saying she's involved? It wasn't until he said it that the expression on his face was one of shock, where he thought, I've almost made an admission here, that or I have made it. an admission. But from my point of view, it was an admission, 
And pro quite frankly, the way he said it and expressed it aggressively, it was a accurate admission. That little moment between you and Ivan Milad is probably the closest we'll ever get to an admission, to a confession. Is that good enough for you? Well, it's better than nothing. Next. Ivan Milat, this is your last chance. With Ivan Milat on his deathbed. How's his health at the moment? It's not good. A final plea from the kill zone. Ivan, you know what you've done. Now is the time to tell everything. It is your last chance. Under heavy police guard, Ivan Milat left the Goulburn Supermax jail last month to undergo tests and treatment at a Sydney hospital. He was then taken to Long Bay Jail Hospital, where the terminally ill serial killer is expected to spend his remaining days. How's his health at the moment? It's not good. He will die eventually, and then he'll be out of pain. It'll all be over. Is he in pain at the moment? I guess we would be with... Well, what, what's he got? What, what, he's got a tumour in his throat and one in his stomach. When Ivan dies, does he have any requests? No. For his funeral? Or oh, any no. last words? No. no. If anything, I'd rather have him cremated so we can put his ashes in a nice place. Where would you put them? Oh, maybe in the Blue Mountains? I don't know. A nice place, though. His brother Boris would prefer Ivan is put in an unmarked grave and forgotten about. I hope he passes on before me. And You're saying the happiest day of your life will be when your brother dies? I, I think his demise would be greatly appreciated by me, yeah. For the damage he's done, not to me, to all those people out there. And he's done a lot. I mean to say, it's nothing you can be proud of. Just, just, just a freak psychopath, that's it. Which brings us back to the psychopath's killing ground. Here in the Belangelo State Forest, the man responsible for locking up the most terrifying serial killer of our time has a final message. Ivan Milat, this is your last chance. If you had one shred of decency in you, you would admit to the murders and other crimes you've committed before you go. You would give some comfort or some satisfaction to the families of the victims who you have killed. Now is the time to admit to everything. Ivan, this is your last chance. Clive Small hopes Milat will surprise everyone by making a deathbed confession, but admits that at this late stage, it is highly unlikely he will ever reveal his secrets. Stay on 7 now. I'm Melissa Doyle, and thank you for making us part of your Sunday night.